So building the LFS cross tool chain and temporary tools. So everything we do in this section here leads up to building the final system. So everything we do here is temporary. It's not part of the final system. It's just a way to get into position to build the final system uh, in an accurate way. Important preliminary material. So it says this part's divided into three stages of, as we've seen. There's a cross compiler, then the cross tool chain is built, and then we enter the true environment to build some more tools before we're going on to building the final system. And as it says here, I've already mentioned it, you should try and understand what it, what each command does. If you're just copying and pasting blindly, you're not going to be learning anything at all. Um, and if you really want the best experience for learning, type the commands in by hand because the fact that you're typing them in by hand means you're double checking it because the last thing you want to do is to make a mistake and end up with a build that you can't complete or doesn't work. Um, and it also suggests using the T utility to output the to the send the output to a file um, can make debugging easier if something goes wrong. I must be I've never done that. I've often thought of doing it, but uh, generally the way a build here in a, a graphical environment, you can go back uh, with the scroll, just scroll back to see any errors that might have occurred further back. Uh, one thing you can do with this, if you right click the window uh, and do a just scroll back, you can set the scroll back to unlimited and it will just fill the uh, I think this writes it to the disk, is that what that's about? Yes, it will write the scroll back to disk so it's effect effectively unlimited in that it's limited by the size of the disk um, because we're in a live environment it's more limited by the available memory but uh, i've never had any problems with that at all but if you are tight on memory you might not want to set that and maybe just increase the uh, history to 2000 lines for example tool chain technical notes there's a lot of detailed information here about how the tool chain or the cross tool chain building works. Uh, I won't go through it. I have got a separate video on how this works as part of the cross Linux from scratch that I did. Um, but basically we're building, it's not a true cross compile in that we're not compiling for a, a different architecture, um, but the same techniques are used. Uh, I think off the top of my head, it's called a Canadian cross compile. Um, but you can read all about it there. It's, it's a good read. There's a lot of information to take in, so you might need to read it a few times or maybe refer to uh, further information on the internet. But certainly if you go to the internet and look for cross-compiling, you'll get an idea of what cross-compiling is all about. But it's, it's a good write-up to read. It's worth uh, reading this. And maybe even when you've got a long compile, coming back to read it uh, on a different occasion to, to understand what's going on. Finally, there's some general compilation instructions. Uh, th this is all very good. I never really used to make a point of this, but I presume so many people have made the same mistakes. Firstly, use this echo LFS to make sure that LFS is actually set. Then make sure the bash set shell is in use. Well, the host requirements script has already done that. Uh, well, in fact, this is what it says here. Uh, we've, we've checked all this already. Uh, and then, a synopsis of the build process. So we've got all the packages in the sources directory. We changed the sources directory. Let's do that now. And then what for each package, we extract the package. We don't do any other commands to extract the package. If something goes wrong, we delete the package and extract it afresh. It's always the best thing to do. If you, and if, again, if you're in any doubt, just delete it and delete the extracted package and start again. Just extract it again from afresh. Uh, try not to delete the tarball. Occasionally I'm uh, not concentrating and I delete the tarball rather than deleting the uh, directory that's been extracted from the tarball. So try not to do that. It just means you have to download that tarball again if you do do it. Uh, once it's extracted, you change into the directory that's just been created. We follow the instructions in the book at that point. 
We then go back to the sources directory and delete the extracted directory unless we've been told otherwise. Uh, and that's just in, well, A, to save this space and B, in case we rebuild that package, which we do with some of the packages. Uh, and those instructions are perfectly valid for BLFS as well. Not just for Linux from scratch. So cross compiling the, or sorry, compiling the cross tool chain. This is the first part where we build a cross tool chain. So you can see all these packages are part of the standard Linux tool, cha tool chain. Uh, and it says there, although the cross compilation is fake, the principles are the same for a real cross tool chain. So we start off with bin utils, extract the package, and it, yes, it will feel a bit alien to start off with, but once you've got a few of these packages under your belt, you'll be doing this uh, with your eyes closed. Extract the package, wait for it to extract. When it's done, we change into the directory that's just been created, which in this case is binutils-2.41. And then we start following the instructions in the book. So the first two commands, well, in fact, something to point out here, it's easy just to copy and paste things like this, two commands, but it's best to copy one command at a time. Take note of what the output is. Invariably, if there's no output on Linux, uh, it's a good thing. The minus V command, which is invariably in, in Linux means verbose, has been set on this, so we should have some output and it's been successful, so that's good. So we can carry on with the next command. If you just copy and paste loads of commands, there's a chance you're missing the output and you won't know if that command's been successful or not. Uh, there's some information here about running the first three commands all in one command with this time command to get uh, a total time so you can calculate the SPUs. Uh, because the configure and the install are quite quick, I just tend to time the make part of it uh, it's it's no less accurate really than doing this command so let's run with the first command which is the configure and this yes is all one command if you remember the backslash just means the command carries on the next line so that's run as i said it's quite quick that configure command i'm going to time the make command So we're now compiling the package with this command here. I'm also just going to open a new tab and run top just to double check that all four calls are being used. And yes, I can see there's four scripts being run there. Also, if I press uh, Z, just to get a nice red up and press one, that will show the individual allocations for each core. And you can see they're each over 25% for my four cores. So I know that uh, they're all being used, so that's fine. So I'll just wait for this to build now. Okay, so that's built. That's taken one minute and 50 seconds. So effectively, you could say with the install and the configure, for me, one SBU is two minutes. So I'm just going to make a note of that. 
just to get an idea for, and like I say, it is a rough idea for later builds. So now I'm going to run make install to install our first package. And you can see how quick that was, just a matter of seconds. So that's done. So what we've got to do now is to go back to the sources directory, tidy up the directory we've just been working in, bin utils 241. And now we can move on to the next package, which is GCC. So once again, extract the package. Now this is a big package, so uh, take a minute or so. I'm on a mechanical disk. Uh, so the machine is quite an old one. Okay, that wasn't too bad actually. Change into the directory, and then we can start putting in the commands to build this. So first we need to do is we need to extract some of the other packages we've got to place them in the GCC directory because they're used by GCC. When we come to do the live, the actual final system, these packages are built normally and integrated into the system itself so that they're permanently rather than what we're doing at the moment. They're just going to become part of GCC temporarily just for GCC's uh, purposes. Then for 64-bit hosts, which is what we're on, we change the lib64 directory to lib. And again, as a recommendation to build in a separate build directory. And then we've got this huge command here to put in to configure the build. So that was nice and quick. And now we run the uh, make command, which is going to be the bulk of the build. Uh, so this is going to take three and a half SBU. So three and a half times two is seven minutes. It should take for me, but we'll see what it will take really by timing it. Uh, and there's loads of factors that affect the SPU anyway. There's uh, things like memory speed, uh, number of channels on the memory, the storage that's being used, uh, amount of cache that's available and so on. So there's there's various aspects. Uh, even the host uh, operating system could in theory affect it because you might have a extremely optimized or a not very well optimized uh, software or compiler initially so that could affect uh, initial initial readings uh, so as i say there's so many factors that affect the sbu that it really is just a rough guide
Right, so that has finished compiling, and as you can see, it took 23 minutes, not the seven minutes that it should have taken according to the SBU. So you can see how inaccurate they can be. That's probably more like 12 SBUs that should have been uh, for my system anyway. So anyway, that's that. It's built. Let's now install it. And we've got one more command to run in here. And it's quite interesting what I was saying earlier on about learning more than just the Linux system itself. They're actually explaining here about two different methods to do the same thing, uh, to execute subcommands in a command. Uh, and as it says there, generally the backticks are discouraged, uh, mainly for two reasons from what I've seen. A, they're hard to discern. And B, I have seen keyboards where that symbol hasn't been marked up on the key. Um, so if you were to type that in, you know, how would you access or how would you know where to access that symbol from that keyboard? So the dollar brackets form is much preferred. So that's all complete. Let's tidy that up. And move on to Linux 6 headers. Oops. So once again, we extract the package. Change into it and start putting in the commands. So first of all, clean the source. And then build the headers with these commands. And finally install the headers. And that's done. Next, we're going to glibc. Change into directory, and then we can start putting commands in. So first is a symbolic link for LSB compliance. can see it's created two links there. Then there's a patch for glibc. And then make a build directory. I'll copy these in at the same time, being as a minimal output. You can see that the MK there has worked and we've, the CD has obviously worked because we're now in that directory. Short LD config and SLN utilities are installed into user SBIN and then copy the configure command. And this one's got 1 1.6 SBU, so let's see how long this one takes. Um, there's a warning there, it says it's safe to ignore, and it says the reports this package may fail and run as a parallel make. I haven't actually seen this fail for many, many years now. Um, but if it does happen to rerun with the minus J1 command, so I'm just going to time this again and see how long that takes.
Right, that's built, so that was seven minutes. So for me, again, that's more like three and a half SBUs rather than the 1.6 that was mentioned, but it just goes to demonstrate the inaccuracy or potential inaccuracy of SBUs and to just literally take them with a pinch of salt. Well, perhaps not literally. Anyway, so that's um, complete. We now install, <coughs> excuse me, it says if LFS is not properly set, you could trash your host system. So let's double check LFS and it is set, which is good, what we expected. So we can run this command in, safe in the knowledge that it will work correctly. Okay, that's done. There's a fix here with a set command and then a couple of checks to ensure that everything is working at this point. So this last command should produce an output that is reflected in the book. Lib64 LD Linux x64, uh, sorry, x86 64 SO2, so that's correct. And if it's on a 32 bit machine, it'll be slightly different. So that's good. That shows the basic compiling and linking functions are working. Um, it says building packages in the next chapter will serve as an additional check that the toolchain has been built properly. If some package, especially bin utils, pass to or GCC pass to fails to build, it is an indication that something's gone wrong with the preceding bin utils, GCC or GDPC installations. So I'm going to tidy up GDPC now. And then we'll have to extract. Uh, yeah, G GDPC we've tied up. I'm going to extract GCC. Uh, we use this to build one uh, package, is it? One, sorry, uh, tool, I think it is, yeah. So CD GCC as usual. And create a separate build directory. Change into it, and then we configure the specific part of GCC, which is the lib standard C++. And we can start building this with make
Okay, well, that was actually quicker than what was specified there. Uh, sorry, no, point two SPUs. That's probably about accurate, actually, then. Maybe just a little bit over. So let's install and then a libtool archive file that needs to be removed. So that's the end of the cross tool chain that we've uh, built. Let's tidy that up. Uh, so the next video will be going on to cross compiling some temporary tools.